Hello, it's API Days Helsinki again. I have here Harri Koponen from uh, Visma and uh, Lappeenranta University of Technology or something. Was that right? Well, the <laughs> actually form, formal name of the university is LUT University. The long okay. version is Lappeenrannan Lahden Teknillinen Yliopisto Lut, which oh we never God. use. Yeah. So yeah, LUT. exactly. For uh, international purposes, LUT. Okay. <laughs> so um, you had something to share in these weird times that we are living all remote. So go ahead, Harri. Thank you. Now, you probably know that in Finland, the mobile coverage and the mobile data usage is uh, the best in the world, I guess. If not, it's in top two each year. So remote working, has it been a chore? Has it been something to endure? Well, this is my office and my hotel from last week, late last week, from Repovesi area in Finland. It worked perfectly. So a million star hotel for the price of zero euros. I'm not complaining. So that is is pretty much um, the roughest you can get. <laughs> so uh, we, are, we are very glad that you're still uh, awake and alive after that experience and so go ahead Harvick. Thank you. I'm actually energized and I'm happy to share a few experiences with you everyone. Um, I said I'm uh, the public affairs guy for Visma Solutions, which is a cloud applications company in Finland, part of uh, Visma Group, um, the revenues of which were about uh, one and a half billion euros last year, so reasonably large European, North, North European player. I'm also a professor of practice in uh, LUT University has stated, uh, with a background in industrial engineering and management, even though I do mostly liaison officer work these days. Um, I've been working with IT and business, combining IT and business, creating businesses out of IT for quite a long time. I worked for a bank, for two telcos, um, in management consulting, so corporations. I've been involved with uh, two startups uh, and the perspective these days is actually quite long. This is actually the type of computer I started my business IT career with. It was actually quite cool, you know, two floppy drives and everything. Um, now the stuff that IT business is made of is no different from any other business. So it's uh, about uh, if you're a good manager, a good business manager, you're doing revenue management, you're doing growth, which is fine. If you are a really good business manager, you are probably doing mar margin management as well. So getting interested in cost. And if you are an exceptional business manager, you have some understanding of risks, which we most do not do. And the formula hadn't, hasn't even changed a lot since the 80s, not significantly in the 90s, a bit in the noughties, but now we are in a different ballgame. I first learned about APs as something different than, uh, you know, uh, an architectural choice or an implementation choice or anything uh, as a business tool years ago when a friend of mine from Bainbridge, Bainbridge Island in uh, Washington State, US, told about his neighbor who had gotten interested in the sales tax in the US. You know, in, in Europe, at least in the Nordic countries, VAT rules are reasonably simple. It's easy to duplicate them to any system that actually handles VAT stuff. But in the US, it's a total mess. It was a total mess, it is a total mess. And that's why it's the perfect uh, opportunity for an API to actually solve the problem to re relieve the burden of maintaining a huge number of rule sets for tens of thousands of applications. And he got filthy rich as well. So that got, uh, got my interest, caught my interest uh, quite naturally. At the time I was working uh, at one of the startups, we were doing e-signing digital digital signing with strong authentication for Finnish markets. Um, and we were really happy. We were booming. We had 
gotten our, our sales engine up and running and we were closing each week, we, were, we had like 180 customers, organizations, companies as such. With 180 clients and transactional pricing, one euro per signature, we were also shoe stringing. I mean, tightly. And I started wondering, you know, if we scale up our current business model, if we add salespersons, the customer acquisition cost will kill us. It just does not scale. We had an UI, but we also had an API, which had been created for some specific customer's needs. What we did was that we started experimenting with uh, changing stuff towards growth via API. So where do we stand now? Within a short period of time, we grew hundredfold, which is not bad. In the last 10, year, uh, 10 weeks this year, which has been a special time, we have doubled our volumes. You know, first it took 10 years to create a volume, then it took 10 weeks to double that volume. So now I can tell you, we are booming, but we are free scaling. That's not a problem. And that's because of the model. Traditionally, if you sell applications, it's a challenge. It's not the challenge of technology, but it's a challenge of trust. And uh, well, obviously you need to demonstrate that you have the functionality. So you are showing UIs, which is, well, not sexy. Probably that's why you are seeing the sales types who have great hair products, who, who have slightly oversized rims in their BMWs. Uh, but if you want to sell APIs, there's nothing to show really. And nothing to show means nothing sexy to show. So even the nice hair products wouldn't help you sell these. And it gets even worse. If you actually are a company who provided services API first, you need to approach different people. Why, does, why, why would that be any worse? Because the people who actually create the applications, the people who actually code, develop, maintain, run the systems, who actually need to breathe the code and provide the trust to business users, they have integrity, unlike some business guys. So what would that mean? It means that if you have slideware, you have nothing because you don't have functionality. It means that if you have any flaws, you can't hide them. You can't bend the sale towards something that suits you. There's a need and you either fulfill it or you don't. And to say the least, the integrity actually, it means that most often many of the de development people we I have had the honor to speak with, they are not all that interested in secondary revenue streams or some other tricks that could bend a business person's mind. And I'm not saying that developers wouldn't be business persons. I see them at the core of the business, but it's a different line of thought. So the sales process is more demanding. It requires more of you and you have the customer acquisition cost higher again. So what on, earth, what on earth can you do? Now, if you have something which is of direct interest, of direct, direct relevance and direct excitement for a billion people, just skip this. For the rest of you, I can see only one way to kill the CAC challenge. And that would be working with, partnering with software vendors. Why? because it's about the cost of selling, serving, billing, managing a huge number of customers, which is not something that you would want to do 
when you actually have created an engine that creates magical, magical things in a very limited environment. So, ISVs can do that stuff. You just send some money towards their general direction and they seem to be happy. Now, does this work? Another cloud product of ours is uh, Maventa, which is an e-invoicing platform. It's an e-invoicing operator providing various value-added services. It hasn't closed uh, 180 uh, deals in its existence. It has closed about 140. But that means that it has 285,000 companies using the service. So I'd say that the leverage is all right in that case. Now, when you're selling something, you need to market it and marketing in the widest sense of the world, sense of the word. Um, marketing towards business people is something that many people have skills in. It's understandable, it's testable. Um, it's something that if not in abundance in its good form, it's still available, readily available to anyone. Now marketing towards the development persons is totally different. Now you need to please both to get the deal done. What does it mean to please a business person? For an API that means transparent pricing. It means pricing that supports growth and it means that the developer says yeah. That's it. Now for the developer it's totally different. Um, if you can't test somebody's API without interacting with a person, that API most likely will miss many of its business targets. So you need automation, you need freemium or you need test bits or uh, all that sort of stuff. You need documentation, yes. Would a business person read your documentation? No. Would a developer do that? Most likely, yeah, at least to an extent. But of course, if you provide code, SDKs, Xcode examples, ready packaged solutions, just add or API key, you are in a totally different game. Um, it also needs to do the thing. You know, slideware just doesn't work in API world. So you need something that actually produces value from the very first session of tinkering, which is not all that is to do. It's easy to do uh, when somebody has done a lot of work. The product is the API. I mean, if, um, if you think of uh, the traditional approach where you build an UI and it has some code behind it, it's, I would say it's a hopeless starting point for API driven business, for API driven business development. Now there are hybrid models. If you are using API, uh, UI or on top of your API and cheating just a little, it's easier. But when you are in the process of uh, transforming or creating an API, which is actually interesting enough to be worth it, you need to prioritize and be API first. Now, I'd say that um, APIs would also be a perfect platform for virality, if you like. This is not a good time to talk about virality. I'm just saying that please leave your business people outside when uh, you are designing the virality bit. Most often they come up with great ideas like coupons, you know, five free somethings, and uh, it's an insult to most people's intelligence. So, um, if you think where we stand now with regard to using APIs as drivers for growth, for business development, it's a proven track. Even if you are not the venture capital driven 
regardless of cost, grow type of company, you probably have assets, you have data, you have transactions, which could be packaged and should be packaged. Because what I'm saying is that more and more people are now adjusting or actually are growing towards a situation where both demand and supply of the most valuable digital assets are packaged in APIs. It's never a solid business decision to skip a transformation. Just think of your Kodak moment. So what you can now do is join Chapati towards API-driven business development. There we go. So, um, it was a really interesting presentation. Uh, and I just wanted to say that uh, I love the K-Pro picture there in the <laughs> beginning because it was my first computer, like, I don't know, five, six years old. And <laughs> mom brought it home so i totally get you um and then i need to 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 say too before i ask my question that actually the visman uh the netvisor and momenta uh apis were one of the first ones that uh we used i was working in an erp company and and we had all kinds of integrations and we had we were building our own api since 2009 i think but those were really like the first real-time apis that you could use and and i remember at that time you you had this um it was pretty decent documentation with mostly examples of the api calls we did have to do some trial and error then <laughs> but it was still kind of we we got it um so that was much more than most but how do you kind of see this for this one i mean you have had in most of your products uh such a long time these apis that that is it even like generation two, three or four already? Or like, how do you see the renewal of these APIs? Yeah, that's, that's actually a great question because I'm not saying that there wouldn't be a burden of legacy when you've had a system up and running or let's say a service up and running like two decades. Uh, what we do is, uh, for instance, for NetVisor, we, periodically evaluate what the market will need in a few years time and we adjust our roadmaps which has a i would say a core of api development to meet the needs of our partners but also what we want to do is to create new opportunities for the partners mm -hmm. so these both need not only technical work i mean we have changed the um, the interfaces from SOAP to REST to RESTful to something else. Uh, we still use various other older technologies, but it's always about business. Either supporting our business, you know, the equation between revenues and cost for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But I'd say that there's no business decision done without the thought how this will help and impact our partners and our, our customers' lives. So yeah, it's it's technology decisions driven by business. So do you share these roadmaps with your partners or with your customers or how does that work? How do you keep in sync? Uh, we try to keep our stakeholders informed, but obviously there's a lot of behind the scenes work. So yeah. let's say that the full roadmap with everything that needs to be done behind the scenes, no, we are not sharing that. Of but course. Uh, of, of course, we want to give time to our partners, our ISVs, mm -hmm. to be able to leverage the new functionality, mm -hmm. for instance, and uh, adjust and create solutions uh, that they will be able to provide at the moment that we actually go live with the API. And, and in your business, I mean, the, anything with money usually takes some years to even, <laughs> even change. And then you have all those like legislation and tax rate and whatever, like all kinds of changes all the time coming up. I re you remember we had this kind of calendar of all the known and unknown events happening every year um, and trying to keep in sync with all the vendors with the APS. But 
how do you see this um, kind of, how do you see the uh, evolution of like invoicing evolution? There's a lot of stuff. I, I just talked with uh, TXS Hanna, who is talking on, on, on day two there, that uh, they, they are really heavily investing on the interoperability of the e-invoicing as all European Union. But it's like, for me, it's counterintuitive in a, in a way. <laughs> like you used to have already APIs for the e-invoicing and now there's this other stuff going on. So how do you see this area developing? I, I mean, for the ne network effect to take, uh, take place, for the growth to happen, we need to have standards, obviously, mm -hmm. unlike PEPO for European e-invoicing, mm -hmm. that it's a must-have thing. But obviously, the market is going faster than any standard would ever, ever yeah. go. So how to add value, how to capture even more processes, how mm -hmm. to drive the rate or level of automation ever ever higher that requires work that can't be just implementing standards o yeah. obviously we are involved in various discussions for instance in um, nordic smart government which mm. you know well, the real-time economy discussion moved there a while ago and um, yes there's good stuff which is going to happen but if we just passively wait for the mm. standards we will yeah, so always be late for the opportunities towards yeah. our customers. So you have this kind of strategy that uh, some of the Nordic banks had also in PSD2 that you want to be more on the kind of hype curve there, um, more top on it uh, than, than waiting what will happen. That is a, Well, I, I well. wouldn't say hype. I mean, <laughs> no, you know, but, I mean, uh, creating hype is not us. We just yeah. provide, yeah. you know, functionality. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I have to say, kind of as a conclusion, that as a user of your APIs, I really like that my team at the moment like that uh, there was usually all the stuff that you could see in the user interface was also available with the APIs, sometimes even more stuff. And that was, <laughs> that was really good because there's nothing more annoying than finding out that you just can't do something because it's not in the API. But hey, thank you. It was a really good uh, talk and uh, waiting for the live discussions. Thank you.